Hope I decided to show you our next interview with Dick Pace, World War II aviator, just turned 100 years old. And we wanted to show you a few of the airplanes hanging in the Naval Aviation Museum that Dick actually flew. Here's the N3N, which Dick flew as a flight instructor down at Corpus Christi. Here's F4U Corsair that Dick flew when he was in Saipan in the Pacific. This actually has the Marine Corps paint job on it, but Dick was in the Navy. What squadron was that? VF-92. VF-92, okay. Uh -huh. And you were a second lieutenant in that squadron? I was a JG. Oh, that's right. First, no, no, that's then right. I was a senior. Okay. Just a regular. Lieutenant JG. Uh, what do you say? Lieutenant. Okay. I, I instructed in these for about six months. In that yeah. steerman? Uh-huh. And we had N3Ns in the same squadron. And the students would go in either one or the other and stay in it the whole training period. But the instructors had to be prepared to instruct in both of them. Okay. <clears throat> and where, that was in Pensacola? No, it's Corpus Christi. Oh, Corpus Christi. And then in about, I think about March of, of 43, they moved all the primary training out of Corpus Christi to okay. primary bases. Okay. And there were a lot of ferrying of airplanes. I ferried one, one at a group up to Kansas City, and they made all of those German instructors, SNG instructors. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and we then moved to the final end of the training period, and we had a lot, a lot of gun ray and a lot of acrobatics and dog fighting and things that were a whole lot more fun than hoping he didn't get killed. <laughs> <laughs> in the Stearman? Did, you didn't yeah. do aerobatics in the Stearman. Yeah. Did you do aerobatics in the Stearman? Hmm? Did you do aerobatics in the Stearman? Yeah, oh, and everything. Yeah, we were now not, uh, totally unrestricted. Really? I even tried to do an outside loop in it, but it wouldn't move it. <laughs> How did that go? An outside loop is where, you know, a loop you come up and you couple of wood. An outside loop is where you go around this way. All right, okay. And the fuel is in the upper wing and goes to the engine through a little piece of tubing. Okay. And every time you're under negative G, the engine stops. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> As even doing a loop when it's upside down, there's no gravity. The yeah. engine stops, but it didn't hurt anything. But to do an outside loop, you put negative G's on it, and it just, you couldn't And it, it shut it, it down? Yeah, it Did you take it to the point where it shut down? Huh? Did you go as far where it shut down with the negative? Oh, yeah, yeah, we didn't worry about that. <laughs> it, was, it was totally unrestricted. You could try anything you wanted to. Inverted spins were commonplace, normal spins. Uh, inverted folding leaf going like this. <laughs> Did you, in the Stearman? Yeah. <laughs> well, like I do is get it upside down and stall, and then when she starts going one way, you hit the other rudder, and she goes down there oh. and just keeps switching back and forth. And she goes, that's a little disorienting. And, yeah. But they're not bad. <laughs> <laughs> that's crazy. So how much time did you have in the Stearman? I did How much time did you have in the Stearman? I, I really didn't figure it out. I probably oh. had, well, there were some other days some of the months we get about almost a hundred hours. Okay. Well, I'm almost had a few hundred, I guess. Okay. Uh, I was glad to get out of them though. Were you really? Oh boy, yeah, I was tired of those things. <laughs> <laughs> so you went from the Stearman to this plane. What was that? And I went to the SNJ. Oh, SNJ. Yeah. Okay. And we loved it. Okay. It was a really nice airplane. And when I was 80 for my Christmas present, Gene gave me a front seat ride in an SNJ. Oh, wow. And the guy came up here with it, and I got my old flying suit from the museum where I donated it to borrow. And well, I got in it, and the fellow said, I don't know anything about you, so I'll take care of all the takeoffs and landings. Okay. But uh, when we get up a little altitude, you take over and do what you're going to. So that's what we did. We got up about three or four thousand feet. Loops, everyone slow roll. <laughs> and if I could say it without appearing immodest, my wing overs were far, far superior to it. <laughs> Very graceful, up and down, just stops. 
comes down on the way, they go back and forth the swing. That's great. He he said to the he was overheard, somebody reported to me, telling somebody we got back down. He said, You see that little guy over there? He can fly he hadn't been in one of these things for forty years. <laughs> and he can still fly better than I can. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's amazing. That was just fun. Here's the my dad's sailboat. <laughs> And this is the boat that we won a third place trophy in the St. Peter Vanna race in about 1948. Wow. And that picture over there, the third from the left, is myself getting the uh, trophy from Commodore Raphael Posso of the uh, Havana Yacht Club. Wow, that's what and you- The Havana Yacht Club was so dignified that when the president of the country, Mr. what is his name, Batista or something like that? Okay, Batista, yeah. Applied for membership, they gave him back the message, as president of Cuba, you're welcome here any time, but Sergeant Batista uh, didn't make the cut by the directors. Wow, that's <laughs> crazy. So you guys would take that boat from Pensacola this to boat, Havana, Cuba. This boat was made in New York uh, by Mr. What was his name? I can't think of it now, but he made it for himself. In New York, I think. It's the same, kind of a class called a New York 30 or something like that. New York 30. But he, he built this boat for himself and then sold it to some guy in the Great Lakes and my dad bought it from him. Okay. And brought it down here down the Mississippi River. Oh really from the Great Lakes? Uh huh. What year would that have been? No, no, we raced it two years, forty seven to forty eight. Okay. And okay. that was a real international race. They had boats from Great Lakes, even Europe. And then when I got in the Navy, my first five or six months I got in, I knew I was going to get drafted because they told me about that. I got, that was the first year they had the draft, and they told me that I was safe as long as I was in college. Okay. But as quick as college was out, they were going to come and ask me. And so at <laughs> spring vacation in April, I went to the Aviation Cadet Selection Office in Atlanta and applied. Okay. And uh, the first thing they did was put me on a scale with a measuring for your height right across your head. Right. And the sailor said, hey, Commander, this guy is a little too short. <laughs> and he said, well, put it across the top of his hair and send him along, God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. They were going to take you anyway, weren't they? <laughs> So, so anyway, I graduated on the 15th of June, and as soon as I got home, I had orders to start. Really? Uh, yeah. So and, you, and I got up there on the 2nd of July. 2nd of July in Corpus Christi? No, I went to Atlanta. Atlanta, okay. And Atlanta, the field was under construction, and everything was going on. All we did was drift and, I mean, uh, drill and study and watch the planes <laughs> <laughs> to do that. And finally, they had a vac vacancy for... I think there were 30 something of us. Out of state. Nobody had ever gone to Corpus Christi from Atlanta. And they sent us down there. Okay. And we got down there uh, around the 1st of December. Okay. And okay. Uh, we, didn't, we were restricted to the base and weren't doing any flying. Didn't have our own rooms. We were in the upstairs lobby where they were had double decker carts and going to meetings where they would give us lectures. And the one that was Friday before the Japanese attack on the 10th, one of the guys, I mean, people in the audience, was, when they said, what, any questions, asked him, what about if we ever had a war with Japan? And the head man said, ha, 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 if we ever have a war with Japan, our biggest problem would be to get them to come out and fight. 
Really? They were already on their way. When yeah. they, <laughs> <laughs> they were on the way to Pearl Harbor that night, yeah. basically. And so Sunday, we got the word about the attack. Monday, we went to the same room for the assembly. And the same guy got up and said, oh, eight, you people came down here to have a good time, learn to fly and have a good job waiting for you. All that's changed. So there will be no more days off. Every time we work a week, working, we start a new week. And uh, so don't hear any whining about it. It's gonna be things different around here. <laughs> And so that was in the Stearman too, right? That was all. No, the we didn't have Stearmans then. Yeah. Okay. I was in an N3N. N3N, okay. Uh -huh. N3N it. was not as much fun to fly. It was not as sensitive as kind of sluggish, and it wouldn't stall cleanly. It was just sit there and coast all day. But when you were in a, a Stearman, she'd land. There was a spoiler on the lower wings, and when she'd stall, she'd come down nice. Okay. And, okay. Uh, <laughs> It was a lot more fun then. Wow. But I never did get to fly this gym as a cadet. Oh, you didn't? Okay. No, I all I had was S and three ends. But it was a strong airplane. It was made up in Philadelphia in the Naval Aircraft Factory. Okay. And you could bang them around. It didn't mind a bit. That's <laughs> funny. That is great. So you once you finished at Corpus Christi, where did you go then? Stayed at Corpus Christi. Okay. Now that sounds like a terrible thing to do somebody, but it was actually if I may be permitted without appearing a modest, sure. yeah. they were taking the top guys in the class and making instructors. Okay. And the BTS and everybody else got a pretty good duty. And we were working, my God, off our tail off. Yeah. I wish I had my logbook, I'd show you. Sometime I'd fly nine hours in a day and two hours at night. Okay. So tired at night really? I couldn't sleep. Yeah. Okay. And my okay. blood pressure was going up. Uh, I was in a mess, but it's fine, it settled down a little bit. When we transitioned from, S, from N3Ns, and then to S, no, it was NTNs by then, the, to uh, the, the SNJs, we were so thought we were such cocky, real experienced instructors, so we didn't mind anything like proper checkouts, anything. Somebody just showed me how to start the SNJs, and that's all I had to do. I didn't have anybody ever give me a duel or anything. So I'm down, we're down at Kingsville now. They moved the whole mess that was down there. And one of my friends, another instructor, said, let's go for a flight in an SNJ together. Okay, that's well. I hadn't had one yet. So we thought, well, we'll make a f formation takeoff. You leave and I'll be right there. So we got there and I got right behind them, a little to the side, and we gave it to power and took off. And as quick as we got off, I remember they were telling me, we were right to the wing of, Rob, they were telling me that you should switch to the other tank that was full, and then later on you could shift back to that first one that had a standpipe preserve. So I'm flying right there with my eyes fixed on that guy, and I reached over that fuel selector valve and gave it two clicks, one to the other main, the one that was the right main. And we were still flying, we got up to about 300 feet, and my engine stopped. <laughs> Just sounded like an explosion in there. And I looked at the fuel gauge, and I had turned that thing three clicks to off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, did you get it restarted, or did you land it? We got a little hand pump in there. I like to set it on fire. <laughs> <laughs> and the engine started right up, and when it got some, I, well, I put the thing on the full tank, Hit that pump, that engine took off. <laughs> no sweat, and nobody ever heard about it. But, oh, really? So you told them? Yeah, but if coming. I had hit the ground with both tanks full, I'd have probably gotten kicked out. Yeah. I mean, can you imagine running out of fuel with everything full? full. <laughs> we trained all over the place. I, I trained at Daytona. I got a summer of special F6F F training. Then we went up to. Uh, Great Lakes and did carry landings, and they went down to Norfolk. And I wasn't doing the thing there, but waiting orders. And, okay. And finally, I was ordered to new squadron being formed at Atlantic City, VF 92. Okay. And moved up there, and uh, that was nice duty. We uh, had a 
the skipper of the field was a famous naval aviator named Swede Vedersa. Okay. And he had become an ace right off in the war flying a dive bomber, shooting down jet planes. He shot down nine planes wow. before the Battle of Midway even. Okay. He was the head of our field. And they had given him a little F4F to be his private transport for going down to Washington for meetings and whatnot. And when he would take off, he would get that thing, and as quick as it lifted off, he would go over and invert it, <laughs> grab that crank that cranks up the wheels. It was the same one they had on the little Grumman fighters. And the wheel gravity was trying to fall. All he had to do was very gently wrap <laughs> it up and then roll out level, and his wheels would be retracted. Oh. <laughs> and, and rolling upside down with no, no airspeed, no altitude, takes a very confident pilot. Okay. And then after that, we were sent to uh, to San Francisco to await orders. Okay. On a, we were going on a ship to Pearl Harbor. Okay. And we were there maybe a few weeks. And it was crowded. They had the bunks and players like in the library or something. Wow. And uh, we went out to Maui then. Okay. And we went to Pearl Harbor and they took us down to Maui another, and stayed down there a while. Okay. And there we had a delightful cruise on the uh, Wasp. Oh, you were on the Wasp. Had okay. a wonderful time. And one day, one day, we did uh, we did combat air patrol. Okay. And we took eight F six F up to ten thousand, and orbited the ship with reduced power. And whenever they would see a civilian plane, and they told us to stay away from civilian planes, don't scare anybody. Whenever they'd see anything, they would give us a vector. And that, that is why he sends you on this heading to intercept it. The idea would be to intercept it if they were Japs. And he would call us up and say, a vector, 270, Angels 10, gate. And that meant get on 270 on your compass. Uh, Angels 10 was near 10,000 feet, and gate was wide open throttle. Oh, wow. And we'd go out there and intercept this innocent civilian airplane, and we'd break off to get them on both sides, and then everybody, all eight of us, would dive at them and just there missing them and love our hair and <laughs> probably scare them to death. <laughs> oh, wow. And, uh, and that then, was an F4. That was a lot of fun. And then the, that afternoon, we had a firepower demonstration, and that's that they put all of the big wheels back on the stern of the ship on uh, camp chairs to watch a dive diving demonstration. And they were pulling some kind of a wooden spar behind the ship. And the plan was the dive bombers would go up to 10,000 feet, four of them, and dive on the target and drop the bombs. And we will, according to the current doctrine, be up there behind them until they started their dive. I was leaving four fighters. Okay. And then as soon as they started their dive, we were to get ahead of them and strafe for anti-aircraft suppression, strafe the target before they dropped the bomb. Okay. So everything went off what I thought was fine. We were up at 10,000 and we were circling around watching the bombers to be ready to be close enough to get ahead of him. And he's right in perfect position. He peels off to go down. Everything looks great. So I quickly got ahead of him and with my four uh -huh. and couldn't see him anymore after that because <laughs> I'm ahead of him. Right. He changed his mind for some damn reason. Everything wasn't something he maybe, I don't know what the hell got into him, but he changed his mind, pulled out and left just the four of us. And so we went down and fortunately strafed it so well that we sank it. Oh. <laughs> and all the big shots watching it thought that's what the plan was. <laughs> it was sheer luck. <laughs> oh, wow, that's good. It was a lot of fun. That's good. So how long, how long were you in the Pacific then? Huh? How long were you there in the Pacific? Oh, I would say that a few months. I'll okay. tell you something else when it happened. Everybody wanted a Jeep. That was the only transportation. You couldn't have a car. We had two nice guys for ensigns, and they stole a jeep 
that belonged to the army. It was really not like a theft because they weren't going to be able to take it anywhere. Yeah. They were going to just use it while they were there. <laughs> and they wanted to get a set of numbers and letters to paint on it that would be correct, but uh, so it wouldn't raise any suspicions. And they figured the safest thing they could do would be to copy our air group commander's jeep and put the numbers he had so that they knew that that would be a decent number and permitted to come and go from that field, which they did, <laughs> until one day they came in right behind the air group commander <laughs> and the whole sordid story came out. <laughs> <laughs> what happened to them? They were under severe probation and all, but nothing happened to them. <laughs> <laughs> they knew they were going to be going overseas further, so they didn't do a damn thing to them. Yes. Yeah, so good. then we went back to Pearl Harbor and got on another baby flat top okay. and went to Guam. And uh, they put us on a, an airplane that night and sent us up to Saipan. And we were up to Saipan to wait a carrier. And we waited for three of them, and every time we'd be about to get one, he'd get a kamikaze attack, and we would be still there. Huh. And so we were still there. We, would, we did some, some combat air patrol with vectors. These things, these time, like we hoped were the Off right the thing. Off the is where you were doing that? Uh-huh, okay. and we'd get, we'd get the duty, and they had special planes painted the tail white, and we'd sit in the little wedding room with the planes warmed up and the parachutes draped across the seat, all ready to go. And we'd get up there the night before, and they'd get it up before daylight and get everything ready. And we'd sit in this little ready room with a telephone. It was just a one-way connection, and it would be the, the uh, director on the radar. And he just had one word to say. He would say, scramble. And when he said that, everybody would run out and jump in his plane start the engine, don't even put on the parachute, take off, and then say airborne with eight chickens. A chicken, for some reason, was a friendly fighter. Okay. Uh, that doesn't sound very inspiring. <laughs> and then we had, a, had an airstrike on a, a bypass Japanese base called Rota Island and nothing was going on. I looked for a decent target to drop my bomb on. It wasn't anything, so I went over and dropped it on the uh, water where I had a death bomb with all that was a hand. Okay. But nothing going on. Okay. And uh, one time I was given a a job, a baby flat top was passing by, and they asked our skipper to send some planes out there to give them some practice landings. They were going from Pearl Harbor to the Philippines. Okay. <laughs> And he wanted some play, some paints to come out there and give him some landings practice. So I was leading four, and we went out there and found them all right. But it was a glassy calm day. Okay. Just glassy calm. And so when we came down to land, we checked in with them and everything. They said, okay, let's get started. I was leaving, making the first landing. With no wind, you don't have any headwind when you land. And headwind is what gives you air over your wings to make your plane fly. Mm -hmm. And it also slows down your plane to help it get stopped. Mm -hmm. There was nothing. And I had happened, happened, I'd seen it happen before. Whenever that happens, a Hellcat won't stop. It'll hit the barrier. Oh. Damn near run the plane, sometimes does. Okay. Because you're coming down, that's, it's just too fast to stop. And so, but hell, he wanted me to try to land it. That's what I was going to do. I could see myself ending <laughs> up in the Philippines without even a toothbrush. <laughs> but he called me back up on the radio and said, we don't have enough wind on here. Please wave off and don't try anymore. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. <laughs> right. We had some time to spare out there at Saipan. And we found out there was a great big pile of 300 gallon belly tanks for a P-38 located up the island, not far from where we were. And there was not a P-38 within a thousand miles. Nobody wanted them at all. And you could go up there and put one on a truck and take it out of the case and open it up and take a skill saw, it was plywood, barely, and split it long ways with a skill saw like a watermelon 
and open it out and take the pipes out of it and everything and then go over to a Quonset hut under construction and find a piece of plywood that they probably wouldn't need and take it with you and make a deck out of it and hold it together like a little two-piece catamaran. Oh. Go to the CBs and ask them if they would um, make you a mast and rigging for the proper compensation, <laughs> a little whiskey that was always any good, more, more money when I could. <laughs> Get it all done. The parachute man made sails out of a rayon gunnery targets with his sewing machine for us. Wow. I needed to have it painted so I, there's a telephone number for the paint department. So I called it up, got a hold of a chief, and said, Chief, I have just made a little sailboat and I wonder if you could get it painted for me. <laughs> he said, Lieutenant, don't you know everything we have here was shipped 6,000 miles on scarce cargo space of vital war materials? <laughs> and I said, Chief, there's a quart of whiskey in it for you. <laughs> and he said, where's the boat and what color? <laughs> Everything's all right. I'm still doing combat episodes, one thing or another. And then, they dropped the atom bomb. Okay, you were and in Saipan when they dropped the bomb? Hmm? You were in Saipan when Still they dropped there. the bomb? Still there, and we got a message from Admiral Nimitz. He said, do not initiate any combat actions with the enemy, but if attacked, to shoot them down in a friendly fashion. Did it really? <laughs> 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 so um, they knew I wasn't going to request a Navy career. They had already had a question there was a fill out about that. And before I knew it, I, I was uh, discharged and sent up to a place for a couple of days to wait, put on a, a big tanker that was anchored out there. And it took me all the way back to Panama Canal. I think we were three weeks nonstop. Mm -hmm. And then up to Galveston, Okay. another week. And I got out, got on the train, went back to Pensacola. Wow, that's crazy. <laughs> so when did you fly the T-6? Did you fly the T-6 when you were instructing? A T-6? T-6 to Oh, yeah, I was in that for a couple of years, I think. Okay, before, I you, before you went into the... Yeah, but right after, yeah, from California. I went from California, from Corpus Christi up there for a while. I got ordered to go up there. Okay, what did you think about the T-6? I loved it. Yeah, It okay. was a lovely airplane. I loved every many of it. And then if you ever get one, I'll give you a, a clue that may save you some trouble. Okay. It was built under an Air Force contract. It came in with a machine gun and the way the Air Force wants them, I think, in the wing. And, and uh, the wheels steered, the rudder pedals steered the tail wheel. And with you, you could work it with your feet on the rudders, and you steered the tail wheel. The Navy was either unlocked or locked, and when it was unlocked, it would full swivel, and when it was locked, it was locked straight ahead. But the these were built on, under Air Force contract, and they worked like that. And a lot of people complained about losing control when they were landing, and what they were doing was landing the thing, and wanted to keep it straight when she was, after she'd landed and she tried to get off course of it, they'd get to the kick in those rudders and when it changed, turned more than 15 degrees, it would unlock. Okay. And the tail wheel was free swiveling and they plumb lost all control of the, of the tail wheel then and would have a, some kind of an accident on it. Okay. All you had to do when you come down to land was just put your feet right behind the rudders centered just right together and if she tried to go one way or the other just tap one rudder a little bit gently and straighten her up i flew the things the whole time i was there i never had a bit of trouble problem at all and it was that. so easy and they made some hard out of it okay yeah that is that's great you told me one time about uh was it someone that you were working with that was doing a wing over and they'd shut the engine off and come back and land was that, I thought you oh, were telling me that story. What was that story That's about? a good thing. I, that, this was Tommy Thompson out of 
our kinfolk, the, the father who's dead now, the one that was married to Francis, right. married for Norna first and Francis. Hell of a nice guy. When I was a freshman at Georgia Tech, I was in the Navy ROTC. That was my first year there. I was only there one year. And when I came home for Christmas vacation, Tommy was an instructor here, a primary instructor. And he said, as a Navy personnel, you're entitled to f fly in Navy planes as a passenger. How would you like to go for a spin? I thought I'd love to. So he said, swell. So he gave me directions. What went, plane was this now? This was a, I think it was a, it was either an N3N or a Stearman. I didn't okay. know the difference in those days. Okay. I, I, I believe it may have been an S-N3N, I'm not sure. Okay. So we won't go out there and we flew around and had a good time. He said, would you like to do a quick store landing? I think that's what his words were. Yeah. I didn't know one print for the mother. I said, I should. So we went down to a Navy outlying field, a practice field. And he flew down the field, uh, downwind. I said, opposite way when you land, right off the ground, looking good to see if there were any obstructions or any other plane, no traffic around it. And when he got to the end of the field, with the rain field to the back, he pulled it up into a sharp climb and <laughs> shut the engine off at the mixer control. Now that means he didn't just shut it down to where it would idle, he turned the damn thing off by stopping the fuel and pulled it up into a sharp climb, just like that. And there he is with the field behind him, nothing out there in the plane out of air speeding out of everything. And when it stopped, he tickled that water a little bit and then it do a wing over, and the plane swung around, and it had enough airspeed to gain control, and he picked up flying speed before he hit the ground, got the nose up over the fence, and laid in the gentle as a baby carriage. <laughs> <laughs> that is crazy. Yeah, <laughs> and I've never seen that done at any airfield. I've never heard any pilot tell me he ever did it, and uh, that's the only one I ever heard of. And you can see why, because some screw up with that wing over to get some airspeed back, it's just your neck. Yeah, it's over then, right? <laughs> <laughs> but that's a whipstall landing. Okay.